Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 179, we're going to talk about impedance matching components. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Okay, recently I got a great question on our new stepped attenuator kit. And the gentleman wanted to know why I chose such a low input impedance. And that got me thinking maybe it's time to revisit this very important topic. After the performance of your amp, the impedance both in and out of your various pieces of gear is the single most important thing you need to get right. Okay, now we're going to play with cards, so it won't be totally boring, I hope. And let me grab my poker here. So. Most of you will have some version of this as your input source. So perhaps a solid state phono preamp, maybe our universal phono preamp, which uses the 6 or 12 SL7 uh, tube, or um, maybe you've got one of the popular DACs that's out there. You'll have probably a control preamp and a pair of mono blocks. I've only shown one of the mono blocks. Uh, but maybe you have an integrated amp, so you've got just one big amp, maybe like the R8. And just imagine the R8 as being these two amps combined, with more tubes. <laughs> and then, of course, you probably have a pair of speakers, unless you're really into mono, in which case you only have to buy one. Or a set of headphones. <laughs> or Well, that's not mono. Well, I mean, it can be. It can also be that weird thing where they they actually record it just for headphones. What's that called? I forget. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, binaural, I think? Yeah, that's yeah. it. You got it. Anyways, we're not here to talk about binaural sound. As interesting as it would be. <laughs> okay, so what we want to talk about is impedance. Now, I actually should have gotten out one of my spec sheets. And hang on it just a second and I'll go grab it. Okay, so every quality manufacturer is going to provide specifications for the gear that you own or are thinking of buying. That If you ever find a piece of gear you're interested in that's really cheap and it has sort of like a set of specs that look like they were written on a napkin, well, <laughs> don't don't buy it. Run. Um, but almost everybody's going to have a set of specs, specifications, and we're no different. When we design a product, we test it on the bench, and we'll give you some of the very important uh, specs. And one of them is the input impedance. So this is the spec sheet for the Universal Phono. It's our kit uh, Phono preamp. And the input impedance is selectable. So I always recommend you put a 47K ohm uh, load resistor into slot A. But slot B is open. And what that allows you to do is to install a different load resistor. Now, I don't know what, Charles, maybe 90% of all cartridges in use today uh, specify a load of 47K ohms. Yeah, I think that's about right. Some people will play around with that, maybe put a little bit more, and some cartridges are a little less, and a few are a lot more, but that's your common value. So that's our spec here. Even though it's a variable spec, that's what we recommend for your first resistor. On our output impedance, we have 910 ohms. And most manufacturers of equipment uh, at least the front end equipment, will try and keep the output impedance somewhere below 1k ohm, which is 1,000 ohms. Generally, the lower the better. Generally, the lower the better. But the, the difference between 
uh, let's say a 900 ohm output resistance an 800 and a 300 is negligible because uh, equipment designers will expect that you're somewhere under 1k ohm and their input stage will be above that equal to or above so that's where we're at today and let's take a look at what we've got so let's start with something really simple so a solid state phono preamp has maybe only one setting 47 k ohm so that's 47,000 ohms yeah and that's the recommended load for the cartridge that's back here off screen where you can't see it. <laughs> the output impedance of this particular phono preamp is 3k ohms, which is actually quite high. And I would say that's a warning sign that the design has mm, maybe not as much engineering, perhaps, mm -hmm. as they could. Is that a nice way of putting it, Charles? I think so. <laughs> okay. Um, now, you're coming into either the input stage of an integrated amp or into a control preamp. In the case here, I've shown the, our universal 6 or 12 SN7, and it has an input impedance of 100 K ohms. Now, that's a nominal impedance. It'll be most likely slightly lower than that, but at 100,000 ohms, it really doesn't matter whether it's 87,000 or 92,000. So we're really good, right? Because we're coming in from, from here, we're okay. We're coming in at 3,000 ohms and we're going into 100,000. Now, the general rule is you either want to be equal or lower. So lower on the input, higher, <laughs> sorry, lower on the input, no. Uh, lower on the output. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I was going to screw that up, but not twice in a row. Okay, lower on the output, higher on the input. That is the, the general rule, or matched. Matched is just fine, um, but generally speaking, you'd like to see that you're at least slightly lower. So let's move on. So on the output of our universal preamp we we measured it at 800 ohms and on the input of the GU50 monoblock we set the input impedance at 470 k ohms that's 470,000 ohms that's a very typical industry standard what that basically does is it allows 100% of the signal to go onto the input grid of the first tube. Now, what if we had um, our universal phono preamp? Well, it's 910 ohms out. And even though um, it's, it's close to 1K ohms, coming into a control preamp is absolutely no problem. It's one hundredth of the input stage of this control preamp. And this is going to be fairly typical, but you could have an input impedance on a control preamp as low as 20k ohms quite easily. And 20,000, let's say just under 1,000 ohms into 20,000 ohms is absolutely fine. What about if you had a really popular DAC? Well, the input side is all digital. So we really don't worry about the impedance. Um, what we do, do worry about is clock and uh, making sure we are a bit perfect. But that's an, it's a whole other story. It's a whole other story. Uh, but the output of this really popular DAC is only 30 ohms, which is really quite low. And presumably the designers wanted to ensure that they could go into any input stage that you would want to plug this into and not have any loss. Now we're going to look a little bit more at the impedance circuit on a really simple level in just a second. So this is the part you probably have paid attention up until now. So the output of your power amp will probably have a 4 or an 8 ohm tap or both. 
And in the old days, they even have 16 ohm taps. 16 ohm speakers used to be quite common a long time ago. Um, and your speakers will have a nominal impedance rating. And that'll be right on the back, usually, as well as in the spec sheet. And that's because it's absolutely critical because the impedance of speakers is very, very low. So 4 ohms is a typical low value. Uh, these ELACs are uh, nominal 6. Um, our custom open baffles are a nominal 8. Uh, this B&W is 8. And they actually list in the specs that the absolute minimum you can, you can look at it is as a 3.1. Now, why am I saying nominal sometimes? Well, particularly with speakers, it is very nominal. And the reason for that is depending on what frequency the speaker is being driven at will depend on the actual impedance of the driver. It's not just a resistive load, it's also a reactive one, so it changes. Right, and not only does it change, it changes a lot. So some people get really hung up about Oh, how would I drive a four ohm, a six ohm ELAC with a four ohm tap? It, that doesn't match, does it? Well, it, the four ohm tap is a nominal two ohms lower than what the ELAC spec is. So you are golden. You don't need a six ohm tap. And knowing that the ELAC might shoot all the way up to 18 ohms at a higher frequency. You've got to realize that so long as you're close. And generally, you want to be on the lower side. And almost always, you really want to be on the lower side. And the reason for that is you're going to have a power loss. If you were to do this, let's say you took the 8 ohm tap off the GU50 and tried to drive a 4, four ohm nominal speaker, you would lose half your power. Mm -hmm. Or the amp would have to work twice as hard to get the same amount of output. Yeah, and that magic smoke might appear. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and if it did, uh, you'd have a few seconds maybe to turn things off before it was time for a new amp. Well, a new output transformer, most likely. Or some new fuses. <laughs> well, if you got really lucky and the fuses popped. Okay, now, I know this is kind of hard to wrap your head around if you don't work with electricity on your bench on a regular basis. So I've got a couple of schematics to try and help us out here. Okay, so this looks really complicated. This is the universal phono preamp. But if you look at it, the signal is coming in here and here are our load resistors and they are connected up to ground. And they're also tied to the input signal. Here's your signal path. Here's a grid stopper. And then we are right on to the grid of the first stage. And of course, we have an option to put B resistor in, which is selectable, yeah? In fact, you could change the 47K if you wanted to. And over here we have capacitance loading, but that's the story for another day. Another one. <laughs> now, this looks hard to understand, doesn't it? So how about we make another drawing that's even easier to understand? Okay. So here is an RCA input jack on that same phono stage. And here is a drawing of a typical uh, triode. In the case of the phono, it's a 6SL7, which is a twin triode, but bear with me. There's the first stage is one half of the tube, and I've shown the grid the way we would on the schematic. The grid is where the signal lands on the tube electrically, but it's a dead end electrically. Ideally, not in all cases. Though. Yeah, it, but f for a lot of electrical design work, theory and practice, we, we use what we call an absolute. Mm -hmm. And what that does is help us determine what, in fact, uh, the values are at the design level so that everything can be worked out mathematically. So we consider the grid to be an absolute zero uh, dead end electrically. So nothing, you can land a signal on here, nice little sine wave, but it won't, it doesn't go anywhere. But in fact, it does a lot of work, but we're not here to talk about 
how tubes work, we're here to talk about the input signal. So we have an input signal here. You've plugged your turntable into the input jack. And here is our load resistor, 47K ohm, 47,000 ohms. And it's tied to the input signal and it's tied to the ground. Okay, so I've built an ohm meter, Mark 1, for you. And if you have any volt ohm meter built in the last 40 years, 50 years, it's going to have an ohm function. If we measure from the input connection and across to the shield connection of that RCA jack, we will see this resistance, the 47,000 ohms or 47k ohm and that is the input load of the circuit it's mm -hmm. that it's in this case this is as simple as you can get now if there are other resistors in the circuit in parallel in parallel just means that we would draw another resistor here like that right yeah between the signal and ground and that could be anything from a volume pot to uh, the preceding stage having a, a resistor on the output as well. Yeah, so everything that is in circuit that is, um, is after or before a coupling capacitor um, becomes part of that circuit to ground. But in general terms, this is how it works. And if you want to, in most cases, not all cases, but in most cases, you can actually measure your input impedance quite simply. Output impedance is a lot harder. It needs to be bench tested. Mm -hmm. And the scope of this little tube lab is way too short to talk about that. Yeah, which, maybe we'll do it in a future episode. Yeah, it's pretty boring stuff, though. Yeah. yeah, it involves math. Yeah, but it's a live demonstration. That can be interesting, I think. Yeah, but only if somebody starts going zzzz. <laughs> <laughs> and that's no fun. Uh, I, I don't think we're electro boom on this channel. We don't try to shock ourselves too much. Yeah, so <laughs> when it comes to, let me get rid of this stuff. When it, when it comes to output impedance, it's the manufacturer's specification sheet that you have to look at. It's normally fixed. It's not going to be variable. And the only time it's variable, of course, is when you have options. Now, the input impedance can get really complicated depending on what the input stage is like. I showed you a very simple input stage, and you won't always be able to measure it accurately on the input side either. Uh, but in general, with simple gear like what I was showing you, um, yeah, you can measure it that way. So, now... Where things get really um, more interesting is when you start getting close to a matching impedance. So let's just forget about all this stage over here for the moment. And let's say you have a stepped attenuator in your circuit, which is our stepped attenuator, which we, we, just, in, we just designed and just released to test builders. And essentially what this is, is a high quality, the highest quality master volume control I know how to build. So it's got a, a nominal input impedance of 1k ohm. In reality, it's actually always a little bit more than that. So we, but we just call it a 1k ohm input. The output impedance is going to depend a little bit on what the, what the attenuator is in parallel with in the next stage. But in general terms, it's going to be a very low value. Typically, it's going to be something like 100 ohms. So it has really quite low output impedance. Now, what happens here? We've got an 800 ohm output impedance on this preamp. Remember I said a lot of equipment designers will aim to be under 1k ohm. So we're good here. We're coming in pretty close though. We have an input impedance of 1k ohm, but we're lower here, so we're fine. In fact, we're almost matched. And one of the things that I've been observing with 
the sonics of this new master volume control is, I think, attributable to the fact that the impedances actually are very close. And this comes all the way back to that question the gentleman asked. Why did you use such a low input impedance? And the answer to that is, I, when I design equipment, I look at the signal path really closely. And I always want to put as little resistance in the signal path and alter it as little as possible. So even though we could have, we could have designed this with a much higher impedance, we didn't because we didn't want to. We wanted to have as low an input impedance as we could reasonably get away with. And the lowest value we can get away with is? 1K. 1K. Now, here's the interesting thing. Watch what happens. We can actually put the volume pot before the preamp. It can go before, it can go after. It depends on your setup. In our system, it can go, it can actually go before and after. So let's look at it compared to our input options. So we know we have an input impedance of approximately 1K ohm plus a little bit. What about this solid state funnel preamp that has a 3K ohm output impedance? Way over industry spec or standard and totally incompatible with the stepped attenuator. So that wouldn't work at all. What about the universal phono preamp that we designed? Well, it's got an output impedance of 910 ohms and it's almost impedance matched. So that works really well, so that's good. What about a really popular DAC that a lot of people own? It's only got a 30 ohm output impedance and it's gonna work just fine. So now you can see why occasionally some equipment that is either poorly designed or designing on the edge I remember years and years ago, there was a power amp that was designed around the concept of very, very low impedance, which is highly unusual. RGU50 has a set input impedance of 470 K ohms, 470,000 ohms, which is typical. This power amp that was designed in the 70s, I forget the, the impedance, but it was extremely low. And because it was so low, Nobody made a preamp that could drive it. So they had to build a matching preamp. <laughs> now, that was a design choice and philosophy, but what it did was it isolated that equipment as into a very specialized kind of niche. Mm -hmm. And I think there was only one version <laughs> and that was it. So anyways, so with impedance matching, what happens when you have a higher impedance going into a lower. Well, you have a, a loss on the output stage going into the input stage, and you end up losing uh, power that you really can't give up. So it almost doesn't matter what stage you're at, whether you're at the source stage, uh, a master volume control, a preamplifier, a power amplifier, you do not want to give up power simply because your equipment's mismatched. Okay, I hope that helped everyone. I'm sure there's going to be some questions <laughs> and uh, we always welcome intelligent questions. Mm -hmm. And actually something else to note here too, while we've designed this stepped attenuator for a low input impedance, we are going to be coming out with a set of resistors for it that have a much higher input impedance for people that have equipment like this that need that. Yeah, so this is, we call this set A, and it works, as you can see, it works brilliantly with most equipment, but we'll probably build set B around an input resistance of 10K ohms. And, and that's just a much safer number to work with for, for stuff that has been designed with a much higher output impedance, which isn't very much, thankfully. Yeah, and we're gonna get around to that as soon as we have time. And I'm keenly interested to do A to B listening tests in which we have a much higher resistance in the signal path. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now that's going to most likely increase the voltage that's getting transferred between stages, but it does lower the power output efficiency of the transfer between them. So we're gonna have to see how that affects things. Yeah, I mean, right now in our own system,
um, the stepped attenuator just brought the system up one really big notch and yep. it, it had already sounded really good and uh i was i was surprised but Ch charles you were i think you were talking about it all night long yeah it just made such a big difference um yeah so it so getting that impedance match with our amplifier is you know it's making a big difference it doesn't always have to be grossly over um overmatched or a higher load to the preceding stage for it to work right yeah i think that's one thing that's worth noting is that often the input stage of the power amp will be set very very high for the simple reason that they want to make absolutely certain that there's a hundred percent power transfer mm -hmm. and that's typical of the kind of of design work that you'll see with impedance matching engineers for years have tried for a minimum of a one to ten ratio simply to make sure that they they don't get caught in a situation like this yeah you'll also sometimes see one to twenty ratios or things like that being recommended but you know there are gains to be made by cutting it closer yeah okay well hopefully that was informative and Charles, I think you got a few really interesting tubes to show off. Yeah, so let's clear the deck. Okay. Okay, so we've gotten in some more of all of your favorite preamp tubes here. Uh, to start things off, we've managed to find some more Toshiba 6CG7 tubes, and these have been really in high demand. We've had a, a few of our customers just absolutely loving these things, saying they're one of the best sounding 6SN7 equivalent tubes out there. Oh, we've got customers who buy quads of them. Um, the label on there is for the other number, though, it's commonly yeah. in use. Or... 6FQ7. So the, the two of them are interchangeable with each other. Yeah, and actually nobody uses 6FQ7 anymore. 6CG7 has become the standardized number. Mm -hmm. So here's a beautiful standard Toshiba, and you can see that it's testing great. These are really reliable tubes, and we've got something a little bit interesting on here. I haven't actually cleaned up this tube properly yet because I wanted to show you guys this. This is a Spanish import stamp. Um, I'm assuming this was imported to a Spanish-speaking country somewhere, so I thought that was kind of interesting to show off. You find these occasionally on tubes uh, that are imported uh, even into the U.S. and Canada. You'll find them on there. And I think that's a duty sticker. And I think mm -hmm. what that means is that the tube has duty paid on it. And uh, we used to see those on uh, cigarette packs, uh, cigar cases, um, I think even on alcohol. Anyways, there was that, it's really old school, goes back a long, long way. And of course, mm -hmm. tubes go back a long, long way. Yep. So this is going to get cleaned off here before it ships. I mean, unless somebody messages me and says, hey, I like that stamp, leave it on there. <laughs> And we've managed to find enough to get a few more pairs of these in the store. So go ahead and check those out if you're interested in them. And we've gotten in one of our, our more recent favorite 6SL7 WGTs. These are the, I think probably about the last version that Sylvania made under the Philips name. It's also the highest gain version of the 6SL7 ever made as far as I'm aware. They have these really interesting sort of oval offset plates here. And these are just great tubes. They're very clean, very quiet. Uh, we've been running them in the Phono now for quite a while, I think. And, um, and they're just great sounding tubes. Yeah, I mean, in a lot of gear, uh, a high gain version tends to be a little bit more neutral. But mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure why, but in the Phono preamp, they sound really good. They do. And you can see testing really high. Normally a 6SL7 in our tester tests around 80 for new old stock. That's its center value. So that's quite a bit higher there. Yeah. And what happens with, now this is a GM or mutual conductance percentage. Yeah. So what happens when your, your GM goes up, your voltage gain goes up, right? And when your voltage gain goes up, of course, your volume goes up. And in the phono preamp, because it's got two amplification stages, when we mount um, we mount a tube like this in there. We've got to turn the stepped attenuator down <laughs> at least a couple notches. <laughs> so that's the 6SL7, but we've gotten in some really interesting power tubes. So let me just go grab them. Aha. Uh -huh. These are becoming a rarity. 
Well, they have been for a number of years. But lately, it's they've become... I've, I've basically declared them extinct because they are so hard to find. Just about, yeah. Should I back out Yeah, let's bit? back out just a little bit. So we've got a quad of used, good... Svetlana, original Svetlana. This is the St. Petersburg version, KT88. And being a high-powered tube, they're fairly short-lived. Like we were just saying, they're going extinct because they're burning out in people's amps. And and that, you know, being fairly short-lived is relative to a, a fairly long-lived preamp tube like, mm -hmm. the, um, like the 6CG7 or the 6SN7 or the 12AU7. And this applies to basically all all power, power tubes, all yeah. power tubes. Anything that has high current going through it, they just don't last as long as a preamp tube or a voltage gain tube. But my observation is, the higher the power for the tube, the shorter the life. Yep. So we actually managed to get together a used quad, and I can't remember the last time we actually had a used quad in the store. It's been a while now <laughs> and they they always sell instantly and how are they testing though Charles? they are testing right actually i think they're testing over new old stock so at our testing parameters and let me get that in focus there that's a 59 milliamp 53 milliamps i believe is new old stock for these or testing at new old stock so these are all testing tight matched 57 to 59 milliamps above new old stock level yeah now when you have a a testing number whether it's a gm mutual conduction ductance number or a percentage of new old stock for the gm number or the actual emission number at a certain operating point you'll have either dis decided what the center value is or you'll have a spec center value and or your tester will give you the center value that's not a fixed must land on that value so mm -hmm. for example the 6SN7 on our tester has a center value of 100. Mm -hmm. But some new old stock tubes will test as low as 75 or 80, and others will test as high as up to 120, depending on who made them and when. Yeah, so the center value is is literally that, the center value. And typically, most manufacturers will come awfully close to the center value. Or and test consistently on one side or the other a bit. Now. One of the interesting things that's been happening in the last few years is as vintage tube inventories, at least the inventory of quality vintage tubes, essentially starts to head towards zero, is that a lot of sellers are getting very creative. <laughs> so, that's one way of saying it. Yes. Well, we we were just, somebody just got creative with us. Yeah. So I think we're over it, are we? No, not yet. We haven't, we haven't gotten <laughs> the money back yet. Yeah. Um, and um, so uh, what, they've, what they've started doing the last few years is that if a tube tests in the nominal range of a new old stock tube, they call it a new old stock tube. And that is, the testing numbers is the very beginning of determining if a tube's new old stock. Now, tubes that are new old stock can have a little bit of wear, especially if they're 50 years old, because they've been kicking around. They've probably gone through a number of testers over the years. Or if their box is degraded or something, then it's it's common for them to have a bit of dirt or something on them. Yeah. I mean, if they were stored in a barn, they actually look absolutely filthy. Or on a ship, for example, they, mm -hmm. they can be actually corroded and still be new old stock. But what's not acceptable is a tube that clearly was in use being sold as new old stock. And the reason for that is, of course, new old stock tubes sell for up to two times the price of a good used tube. And now you can see why fraudsters, of course, are playing games. Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing they're doing too is not testing them correctly. As we were saying earlier, if you test these on a mutual conductance tester, it might say that they're good even if they're completely worn out and done. So they could use that as an excuse to say, well, I tested the tube. It's good. What are you complaining about? Yeah, so we should back up a little bit. When you're <laughs> testing uh, a voltage gain tube like a 6SN7 or a 6CG7 or a 12EU7, the proper test is a mutual conductance test on a proper GM tester. But if you're testing a power tube like the KT88, the test is completely different. It's an emissions test at normal operating uh, voltage points. And there's a huge difference. So yeah, so if you're buying, if you're buying power tubes, be really careful 
if the seller says yes it was tested on you know uh, B and K or Sencor or any of those GM testers um, it means almost nothing it means almost nothing. it means the tube is lamping and it's working and it hasn't shorted out but that's basically it yeah 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 so be really careful out there folks things are getting spicy yeah I mean even we get caught every now and then so you've got to be extra careful yeah okay well if you stayed this long here's some discount codes to help you out and there's a secret code that people are getting. It's costing us money. And I love to see uh, viewers and returning customers grab discounts. But if it's a small order, we still have a good deal. We can ship to almost anybody in the world for a flat $20. But if you have an order that's $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on us, folks. Stay safe, everyone. Be careful. This is Jim and Charles signing off. Cheers, everyone.